everyone. Welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. Uh, before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phone so as not to disrupt the event. When you get to the time for opening the floor to your questions, we've placed a standing microphone at the end of the aisle to your right. Uh, please line up and speak clearly into the microphone so everyone can hear your question. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. So if you've not already purchased the book, we have many copies uh, available behind our registers at the front of the store. We'll ask you to line up starting here at the pillar, and we'll come by to ask your name for personalization. So please have your books ready for us. Once the event is complete, we ask that you leave the chairs where they are, as we do have another event after this one at 5 p.m. Uh, so now I'm very excited to introduce Bernard Jankowski celebrating the release of Music in the Halls, the heart and heartbreak of teaching at a high poverty school in Washington, D.C. Uh, Bernard Jankowski was head of the English department and an AP teacher at an educational facility serving adolescents with severe emotional disabilities. Prior to teaching, he led a groundbreaking foundation research service. And he has published two full-length poetry collections and is the recipient of the Evelyn Elder Award for American Literature from Montgomery College. He'll be joining conversation with Grace Cavallari. Grace Cavallari is an American poet, playwright, and radio host of the Library of Congress program, The Poet and the Poem. In 2019, she was appointed the 10th Poet Laureate of Maryland. So now, uh, please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Bernard Jankowski and Dr Grace Cavallari. Thank you very much. Is this on? It's on, okay. Well, this is The Poet and the Poem, not from the Library of Congress, but today from Politics and Prose. And this is The Poet and the Poem off air for the first time in history. And we are with Bernard Jankowski. Um, now, we have a history together. Uh, I've known him for years, actually. I knew Bernie as a poet. I knew him as a playwright. And I knew him in many, as actually he was president of the Washington Writers Publishing House where I was affiliated as well. So we have a history together. But I did not know he was an educator because he's had a, a great career as an entrepreneur and many other things as an artist. So last year when I got this manuscript, I could not believe my eyes. I, I was literally bowled over by this and wrote him a letter right away and told him that it was the most powerful book I have read this decade. So we're going to hear about it. And Bernie, what's the title of the book and what's in it? So um, the title of the book is Music in the Halls. Um, it, the, the book is, uh, my wife calls it a cipher because it's something that can lead to a lot of different conversations. Um, it has to deal with me as a white person moving through a predominantly black world. Um, it has to do with all the challenges that educators face in a high poverty school. And more centrally, it has to do with the children. So the real impetus for me to write the book was the children. I mean, initially the title of the book uh, Dr. Ham, who wasn't, he has daddy duty today, but um, he wanted it to be the forgotten children, and in many ways it could be that. So the whole focus for me, getting the book out, you know, my journey was something I wanted to talk about, but really wanted to highlight the children who were in these schools. Well, Bernie, as I say, many people go to college and then they begin teaching right away, and you did not do that. So what was your preparation for this? How did you get assigned to this school, this high poverty school, and what did you expect? What did you want from it? So I had, um, I had had experience, when we had our business, I volunteered for a period of years at Phillips School in Laurel, Maryland, and uh, that's a school for children with emotional disabilities. So I worked with a sculptor there named Stephen Dobbin, and uh, we did projects together that were, uh, every spring I would go in there and do a creative writing project with the kids, and he would do a sculpture project that would go with it, and we'd put them together and have a big show at the Patuxent National Wildlife Center. So it was really like a transformative experience for me 
seeing what the creative arts can do for children. Um, my, the part I could play in that. And one of the things that we did do, uh, which is really central to what we're talking about here today, is it was one of our projects that was called See Me. So every kid in the school, um, they, they, they had a plaster mold made of their face, and then they made a box. And the box, uh, they could do whatever they wanted with it. And they were very creative in expressing a lot of the anxieties they had, a lot of the traumas they had in their lives. Um, it was just stirring to see. Uh, they had a big exhibit. We did it at Patuxent National Wildlife Center, and they also did it at the Baltimore B&O Railroad Museum. But what I found is that I could you know, participate in this world. I mean, the principal called me the Pied Piper. She offered me a job, but at that point, I <laughs> At that point, I, you know, we had the business and I couldn't really do it. Uh, we were still raising our kids. Well, you uh, approach this school. You know very little about it until you enter it. What do you think? Are you a blank slate when you walk in? What are your expectations? You know a little bit about the school, but when you enter the school, what are your apprehensions? What are your thoughts? So uh, it was an anaconda. I so I, I went through DC Teaching Fellows. So D DC Teaching Fellows at the time they don't have one in DC, but it was it, at the time it wasn't. It was very difficult to transition from having a career to being a teacher. And obviously I was older. I was in I'm going into another life, and DC Teaching Fellows made this accessible for me. So it had. Uh, um, it had a very rigorous summer training program, mm -hmm. and that's when I taught at Anacostia at Randall Highlands Elementary School, and uh, with the littles. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we're going to hear a little yeah. bit of your book now. Okay. This is music in the halls, the heart and heartbreak of teaching at a high poverty school in Washington, D.C. So sharpening pencils. Miss Wilson looks at me, a white man, across the river in D.C., shakes her head and laughs. Ha! Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Then can you take care of these? Handing me a dozen pencils. She nods to the sharpener. So this is how it begins, student teaching. I'm an apprentice again, a middle-aged man in training. I've scrubbed pots for cooks, lugged wood for carpenters, humped brick for bricklayers, proof copy for editors, learned business negotiations from dot-com wolves, and it's come full circle to pencils again. Pencils, <laughs> still the instrument of communication. My preparation for the adventure ahead was elementary school. Could I remember elementary school using pencils? I walked over to the sharpener and looked out the window from Randall Highlands Elementary. As the morning haze of dawn lifted from the hills, I saw the majesty of D.C. across the Anacostia River, the monuments and the Capitol, standing proud. But were these institutions blind? Why this divide? What was this world here across the river? Already I was impressed with the beauty of Anacostia, the rolling hills, and the tree-lined streets. Through the lens of news and stories from friends, I had imagined it some Bronx-like landscape of gutted out buildings and empty warehouses. Quite the contrary, I have another one. The area looked green and friendly. Why this disjunct? What was going on? What had happened here? Here I was among the stories of Anacostia, the roughest place in DC, notorious for drive-bys, murders, robberies, and drugs. Here in the middle of it, soon there would be 30 kids surrounding me, all black and me white. Divides, divides, what divides us? Myths of pencils, myths of DC, myths of Anacostia, of white and black, rich and poor, powerful and powerless. From the other side of the river, my new education was about to begin. I was being sharpened, clarified. Well, the power of the book is the way you are immersed in the book from your point of view. And so here you are on the griddle. You walk in, you've been identified as one thing, which is either good or bad in someone's eyes, and you're the point man. Now, how 
did your brain navigate this, knowing that no matter what you did, it was going to be seen as some certain way? How did you deal with that emotionally, going home every night? Um, well, you know, I was not alone. So within the schools, I had allies. I think there's some wonderful people here who helped me out when I was working there, Miss Wooten and others, Miss Nishimura, uh, Miss Toby. <laughs> but um, so people helped, and uh, the the lady here, whose her real name is Miss Sullivan, was just a wonderful woman, and she um, microphone. Sorry, and sh and and she sang her classes, <laughs> so, so I was like, "This is this is kind of interesting." So I, you know, I I started singing too. It's a new day. It's a new day. <laughs> and the kids would be, "It's a new day." So it's, it's a great way to go. So I so I was not alone. Let's hear more from the book. Okay. So who is this white man? Drowsy summer school morning. <coughs> The southern sun of D.C. sifts through the windows. Here with the real class now, time to teach. The 31st graders were a mix of sleepiness, squirmy energy, and bright-eyed hope. As we go over our morning routines and rules, the procession starts. All day, the other summer school teachers stop by to catch a peek, check out my room, to see what this white man is doing with their black babies observing the curious spectacle like a freak show, a car wreck, or a rare bird. Wow. I'm interested, as writers, we collect images. We're not really the source of everything, right? So I'm wondering how this book got written. Did you have a spiral notebook uh, in your pocket, or did you take images all day and just collect, be like a beautiful funnel and just collect things? Or did you wait till you were home and you could look back and reflect on it and Im reimagine it? What was your writing process? So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, as I would, as I was walking through my world in Amidon, uh, you know, various teachers would be, "You got to write a book about this. You got to <laughs> write a book." About this. <laughs> so I was like, uh, you know, well, maybe I should start keeping track of stuff. And uh, so I did, I did keep notes, but it was really the physical separation. So when I left in 2016, um, it just kind of poured out, and there was so, so much there that, um, you know, it really was just a, a release. Release. It had to be said, right? Yeah. It had to it be said. And I felt an urgency, particularly with the kids. Well, the book's fabulous. Read some more. <laughs> it's all about the book. <coughs> Vivid, names. Vivid names etched faces. I came home from work in a daze, lay in bed and stared at the wall. This first week, I felt more like a bouncer than a teacher. I forgot how many fights I had broken up. My wife called up, you okay up there? Mm. Yeah, I guess. In the swirling silence, the bedroom walls became screens and the screens became lit with the faces, their intensity, vibrancy, and pain. I had been dropped into a wild, shook up world and I was shaken up. As I followed the phantasms on the walls, I put names to the kids' faces. I'd never been good at remembering names before, but in the first week, I had learned 50 or more. I whispered the familiar, John, Matthew, Robert, William, Rose, and then the foreign, Jabri, Jayla, Jamika, Tiara, Yakub, Aisha, each name conjuring up the etched truth of a face full of joy, hope, and sorrow. Bernie, under this condition, with the deprivations that you saw, how could they learn? What did they learn? Can they learn? What did they learn? Did they learn something? What did you teach them? Well, so, 
it was episodic. Uh, one of my allies, who who I don't know if she's here today or not, Miss Hughie, but she she took me in, and um, she was one of her sayings was, "In the morning we do school, and in the afternoon we do fool." So, it was <laughs> so you know, there were there were sh there were long stretches of instruction, but highlighted within the book and you know problematic to teaching in that environment is the serious trauma and PTSD that these kids have been through. And but yet so your humanity I that is a word that is overused but it is your humanity that reached them. Well and you know you're you're there you're there day in and day out working with the kids and you know you're a human being they're a human being you're moving through through life you're moving through the halls you're you're learning they're learning so it's not a segmented experience Read us some more please more please <coughs> Street urchins I've seen them in movies and heard news stories about them, but had never lived daily with true street urchins, the ones that come into the elementary school bedraggled, sleepy, starving. Thank goodness for the free meals here. The urchins are the kids that come every day. They need to eat, and their parents, or whoever they've slept with, kick them out and send them on their way, no matter how silk, sick or filthy they are. You can smell the weed in their clothes and see it in their little bloodshot eyes, starting the day already without hope, stoned or wasted or starving or exhausted or all of the above. What's up with your shoes, cuz? Or you're dirty are the sharpest insults thrown at them. The shame is shown in the kids' sagging shoulders, their untied shoes. Their furtive eyes searching the room with the laser beam focus for any food item, even a food wrapper, to stick into their starving mouths, to chew on something to ease the pain. The night is their time of freedom, their time to howl, to feel alive, goofing and living dangerously with their crew, shoplifting, jumping people, stealing bikes, hopping the subways, woofing at adults, together now running the streets and then catch a little sleep before breakfast at school. Often a few are sitting on the steps of the school at early dawn before anyone else has arrived, even in the freezing cold. Their hungry eyes wait for an adult to open the door to the only warmth, safety, and security they know in this world. What was your interaction like with their parents their parents who were not well, their parents who also were subject to all the indignities in the world. How did you try, in a meeting with a parent who was high, maybe, <laughs> how did you interact? What did you feel? What progress did you make? How did you connect? So, again, it's, I, it, I, I don't want to, like, partition the experience down there. So, so for instance, uh, there's a huge grandmother energy down there where uh, a lot of the grandmothers are really pulling a heavy load and um, keeping it all together, pouring, pouring it out, pouring their, their lives out for the kids. Um, also, the way the school was set up was um, it was right so that was one of the one of the revelations when I first got there because I'd never really been in the inner, inner city school. Is like when school's over. There, this was an elementary school, so it was like pre K through <laughs> fifth grade. The kids just go right. So so they they just like run out into the street. You know our kids. You're, you know watch where you're going. And they, and and they, they they would they would just go. And there a lot of the brothers and sisters would take care of the kids. Um, I mean, really, a story, Miss Wooten, who's here today, uh, one of the stories uh, that is in the book is about my, my wife, uh, Kathy. Uh, there, was a, there was a student who had particular food deprivation, it, it deprivation, it deprivation issues, and she made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches so he would have food. 
over the weekend, and um, the parent he would hide it uh, in the back in the bottom of his backpack. His parents were, you know, fr they were crackheads, and so so having all kinds of difficulty. And uh, he he would he would walk up to them, and you know make sure that they didn't know that he had the peanut butter and jelly in his backpack. Well, um, one day I was teaching with Miss Wooten, and um, one of, he came up into the school, and <laughs> he he came at he he because you know it, somehow he got through security, and we were on the second floor, and he came he came like right at right at me, and Miss Wooten jumped like right up in his face, and she's like. You're not gonna mess with my Mr. J. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like I said, I I was I was not all alone. The, you know, and the, there there were the, there were there were some really good parents down there. You know, and so it's not uh, you know an either or situation. I'm it's sure. yeah. Read a little bit about Ruby. Ruby. Okay. So the before while you're finding the page. I have to say that we can all see that who he is and what he is is what made him able. That he was born to serve, obviously, and he took it very seriously. And the book is about that. It is about a man who is transformed every day by what he sees and who learns more than he knew he'd learn. And it's a man who's in the landscape, in the middle, his point in view. So the book is pulsating. It's, an al uh, it's a thing that is alive. Let's hear Ruby. So the, the pretext for this story, um, or this, this part, is I was co-teaching with, um, with Miss Hughie, and um, all the kids were, the 30 kids or whatever, were, s were sitting uh, ready for reading time. Well, I, I would, uh, you know, Ruby Bridges, the, the story of the child, the tragic, well, it's not tragic, it's heroic on her part, but tragic from a, what white people were doing to her. Um, so I was just standing there, I had no intention, I, I had no, you know, I didn't realize I was going to be reading this story. So so Miss Yugi, Miss Yugi got called down to uh, another she got called out of the room for that. She's like, here, read this. So I, I, I had, you know, the story of Ruby Bridges, which was, uh, it had pictures. And um, here I was, you know, the, the white person with the 30 black kids. And, you know, the pictures of the white people being totally ignorant and aggressive towards this poor little kid, right? So, <clears throat> I don't know what your students are thinking. I don't. Well, oh, one one of the, the pretext is when you're teaching, you know, you really don't know what the t what the kids are thinking, right? It's <laughs> like you know, like what are they thinking? You know, when a kid goes like this, I, <laughs> I I I don't know what your stu I, I don't know what the students are thinking, but right now I have a pretty good idea after they've seen the pictures of the hatred of the white people. I had dissolved in many ways from being that white, white man to Mr. J, and over time, when you're with the kids all day, you become their teacher. Some of the racial barriers melt away by our pure humanness, <laughs> by relating to one another so personally every day. I'm in an in-between place, not one of them, but with them, supporting them, listening to them. I glance up and see the clear eyes following me and the pictures of white adults that look like me, except they have clenched fists, mean mouths, angry bodies. They're menacing the sweet, proud, vulnerable Ruby as she walks to school. I don't stop or editorialize. I plow through the text. By story's end, we see how a little girl showed the way, tore down the walls of ignorance, and carved a path. We see that a child can be a courageous leader. There's a long silence. I am lost. How do I lead the discussion? 
I'm disgusted, rattled, and ashamed of what I've shared. I knew about racism, but to see it projected and thrown at little ruby bridges is a lightning jolt. My stomach is sick. I had to hold it in. The kids wait. All are settled in with their brown eyes beamed in on me. I ask for questions. Leah, the bright light who has worked with me to dramatically improve her reading, raises her hand with a concerned and confused face. Mr. J, do you like black people? Are you racist? I didn't know how to respond. I was speechless. I had never explored the depths of hatred so intimately as when reading about it with these precious children and my students, who I practically lived with every day. They waited for a response, and I shook my head with a low, grave voice and answered, no, I hope not, sweetheart, no. That is writing. That is writing. Writing is telling the truth. Writing is courage. And that's what this book is about. I, we feel what you feel. And that's a powerful thing to have to do to, for people. Um, I still, we'd love to hear more from y the book. And I think um, one important part is maybe you have time for all the, on a day's work. because that's a sardonic <laughs> title. All in a day's work. Calling attendance one by one, then Tasia, Tasia? Anyone know where Tasia is? She was shot. What? Yeah, shot last night on the street, playing in front of her house. Is she okay? Don't know, they took her away in an ambulance. So you move directly from not knowing if one of your students is dead to teaching the required English block. You're expected to switch on a dime from the uncertainty of your student's death to focus. On the other 25 students and their needs. I'll have to wait for lunch to call home and find out if Tasia's dead, crippled, or suffering. A teacher who is speechless in front of her class couldn't be, must be the best kind of teacher. Because the teacher that knows everything, that has the pat answer, that isn't what we want to change people. But oftentimes, the book shows he was speechless in front of the class, and that is actually such a great demonstration of what it is to be human that if you taught the young people nothing more than to be real, I think you taught more than that. And there is a, a great, some great passages here of successful learning. I don't want to, for I don't want to go away without citing one of those. So um, there is no crying, crying in the back of the, uh, the eight, page the 18. Things happened. People learned. <coughs> the crying behind the door. I walk to class and hear weeping, a child crying. I look behind the door and there's Jasmine, tears streaming down her cheeks. Her two big eyes stare up at me and I offer her a hand. It's my planning period, so I bring her in the room and ask, feel like talking? No, she replied. Why don't you pick a book off the shelf just sit a while and read. She grabs a book and tucks into her cozy reading chair. What you reading, I ask. Poetry, just poetry. You like that? She sobs a bit more than meets my eyes. Yes, I do. Good. You have time, no rush. She asks for a pencil and paper and begins to copy Blake's poem down line for line. Then they followed where their vision led and saw their sleeping child among tigers wild. To this day they dwell in a lonely dell, nor fear the wolfish howl, nor the lion's growl. Why do they spell, spell it T-Y-G-E-R-S? It should be T-I-G-E-R-S, right? <laughs> That's from back in the day, old English. Oh, you feeling better? Yeah, fine, she <laughs> responds. With each line she writes, 
the sobbing softens. Those were good times. Those were the good times, Absolutely. right? I want you to read more, but is there anything you'd like to tell us about how you're changed as a person from this experience? I mean, you were never exactly a horrible person <laughs> because I knew you. He was always in an altruistic business, in a foundation, helping people, networking good projects, as well as being an artist. But something in you changed, something lived in you that never lived before to write this book. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I think, you know, you can see it in the examples is that we carry uh, concepts with us. You know, I'm not racist or I understand what black people are thinking or, you know, those people down there or those people over there. And so, I mean, really in the fullest sense, uh, the idea that you're, and we had the extended day, so so we didn't have any free trips, Miss Clary. <laughs> it was uh, eight, 8 to 4.30. And, um, uh, you know, it, I mean, the, 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 the shifting that happens within 10 minutes in one of those classrooms is, you know, like, like no no knock on where I've taught in other places, and I don't know if Coach Briscoe's here or not, but he he said you know if you can teach here, you can teach anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And you know and and in, frankly when I the two places my next job I got on the first interview and the, the place I work now hired me and I wasn't even looking for a job, <laughs> so so they you know it's this you learn how to teach under the most adverse circumstances things change uh, like that and uh, so what I learned was um, you know just how beautifully human we all are why did you title it music in the halls so music in the halls the ed the editor and I would like to say kudos to Regal House for stepping up and printing the book um, showing the courage to print the book uh, Janie Royal is the publisher um, so they came up. They came up with that title. I had always imagined it as Ground Zero DC, oh. but uh, actually, as a nice segue from the poem that I just read about uh, the the little girl and the and the poem, um, arts is a huge part of the school there. So Miss Perry, I don't know if she's here, but she she runs the choir there, and they were you know the best in Southwest, and uh, or it wouldn't be any other way. And then also Miss Shorn, I think she, she said she was gonna be here, hi Miss Shorn, is uh, the art teacher down there. So, so the arts play a huge role uh, in these schools regarding, and, and you can see it in that last uh, piece that I read of like holding a space, letting the kids take a deep breath, letting them express themselves, find something, you know, powerful within themselves. You know, before we have a final reading, I would love everyone who taught there to stand up. There are some people here, and I think they need such a round of applause. Oh, woo! All right. Thank you for your beautiful service. Thank you. And give us a final reading, maybe white people? is um, uh, oh, here. Is I, I had a, a, a little mini-me, Vernon Smith, who um, would just follow me everywhere. So we're, we're sitting around a reading table, and I insist that everyone participate. And um, no one's allowed to opt out, so there's like horseshoe tables or whatever and Brianna barks out Mr. Jankowski's doing too much white people do too much <laughs> and Vernon it's Bernard in the book Ver Vernon my mini me pops up from his seat pounds the table with his fist and says Mr. Jankowski's not white <laughs> <laughs> that is the greatest that is the greatest 
Well, um, I we have to touch upon the reality of test scores and bureaucracy and responding to the greater school district. How did people regard tests? They had to take them, right? Yeah, I mean, one, <coughs> one of the things that we didn't talk about was really the setting of the book. So the setting in 2011 is when I started there, and that was right after the Michelle Ree revolution. So, uh, you know, um, that, that was, I mean, it, es essentially it was like a draconian overlay of some odd corporate structure on, on a school system saying, you know, these test scores got to change and they got to change tomorrow, right? And so as we've noted in the book, uh, in the readings that we've done, you know, there's a lot more going on in this world than just the ones and twos and threes and the A's and B's and C's. The kids have a lot of issues. And um, so uh, the incessant testing in particular, or in particularly, is very cruel to uh, the lower performing kids. So they're, they're categorized as, you know, below basic, basic, proficient, and advanced, yeah. So uh, they were the, the lower kids, and, the, and so this is elementary school. So part of the, you know, the depth of, of my heart for this is the primacy of the kids, their primary education. It's like these, these are like little kids. I mean, so much is like just unfiltered. Mm. And um, just to test them again and again, I mean, they, they would tear the test up and go literally running out into the streets. I mean, it was like, so it, 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 was, a, it was a form of cruelty and, and it, it was a total blindness to, to a whole world. Just when I got there, I mean, everything was in disarray. You know, it was just, they, they had many of the teachers who had been there forever. They had, there's a system Michelle Bree brought in, which they still have now, which I think they've refined, so it's not so ridiculously punitive, called impact. And um, the thing about impact is what they did, it, what they did just to sum it up is, they, they, they came in and they made, I think it was like, so you had a score at the end of the year regarding your professional evaluation. It would be like 33 to 50% of the teacher's evaluation was how high the kids had gone on these test scores, right? Well, one, you know, from one class to the next, it could be totally arbitrary mm -hmm. as to what level of kids you're getting. And then also the expectations that they had to meet were totally unrealistic. So it just, you know, caused an extremely stressful situation for everybody. I think that's a good line to end with, an extremely stressful situation for everybody. Um, now is the time when um, the microphone is ready for people to go to stand before the mic and to ask Bernie anything you want to know. Or we can bring the mic to you. And give us your name, too. My name is David. Were you still teaching at this school uh, during the pandemic? And uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the effect of the pandemic on students' learning. So I, I, at the, at after I, I left um, Amidon Bowen in 2016 and went to the Regional Institution, Institution for Children and Adults, which is uh, Children and Adolescents, for, which is a um, school for kids with severe emotional disabilities. And at, at that school, they had, uh, you know, the kids had therapists, smaller classes, and so forth. There's a couple of fine educators from there here today. Um, but uh, the pandemic, frankly, was, uh, you know, an exercise in delusion. I mean, it was it was like it was like here, here you have a whole school system, which schools are kind of like barges, right? I mean, they're not really like sh skiffs. And uh, the idea was like in one week, you're gonna have take this whole school, and you're gonna put it online. <laughs> 
and 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 kids with with you know it, it really hurt the kids who who needed the school environment like the you know the the free meals the uh the you know camaraderie the the a, a lot of you know abuse and difficult situations are uncovered by teachers as mandated reporters so uh, a lot of that stuff went unchecked and the damage uh you know we're still dealing with it so Hi. Hi. tom pollock with dc tutoring Hi, and tom. mentoring initiative hey, Hi. Bernie. We know each other from a previous lifetime yes. here, um, but I, I currently run this DC Tutoring and Mentoring Initiative, which works to get tutors and mentors into DCPS and public charter schools, and would just be interested to hear your perspective on what role tutors and mentors, for better or worse, can play. Well, to to you know dovetail on the on the pandemic, I mean, there's a lot of learning loss, so uh, you know anything that could be done. Uh, outside of the schools right now where educators are running as fast as they can to you know just stay above water is, is, is certainly extremely helpful so if anyone would feel a need to you know participate in that um, you know it would certainly be certainly be needed do you want to give your contact uh, sure yeah you can go to our website dctutormentor.org um, yeah Google it. But I haven't. We, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we we actually support 50 different nonprofit organizations that do tutoring, mentoring, after-school programming of all across the DMV. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Sound. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, one of the yeah, I mean, one of the things about so w one of the things about the high poverty schools is, I think. You know, principals are doing their best, but they get a lot of kudos for having programs. So, 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 you know, there's this program, there's that program, there's that program, there's that program, and you just have all kinds of people walking through the, through the building. And the uh, the FBI, the FBI had a program, and you know, frankly, a lot of the population of the school was pretty. You know, wary of of having an FBI presence in the in the school. So, you know, again, uh, one of the one of the to go back to what I've learned, like, and it's a constant. The great thing about it, being a teacher is you are constantly learning. You have no choice, mm -hmm. or you're going to end up on, on the bottom of a pile of kids, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, but um, there's a uh, there's a there's something that I'm learning more about called cultural dissonance, where 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 Dr. Ham, who's not here, but he wrote the forward for the book, um, uh, this this idea of you know merging education within the cultural reality of of the students, their lives, their their worlds, as opposed to I mean there were times where I was teaching fourth graders. In 18, I don't remember when Lewis Clark was. Was it before the Civil War? I think, but a eight, eight, 1843 text written, written, you know, by Lewis in, in in language, you know, that I had a hard time understanding to the kids, expecting them just to digest this, you know. So, cultural dissonance is something I'm learning about. Any other questions, Jan? Jan Booth uh, from Annapolis. Uh, I, I was a teacher. Uh, I'm a writer. Um, I wondered, you speak so much about how the students are with you. Um, do you still keep in touch with any of them, or are there, do you see them? Well, uh, so, you know, geographically, that's a great question, thanks. But ge geographically, I'm, 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 I'm separate. You know, I keep in touch through, so through my friends down there. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's been some tragic stories, uh, and um, so so not directly, not directly. Question. My name's Patrick, and uh, I'm almost afraid to ask this, but I want to know what happened with the little girl. What? What happened to the little girl? Oh, Tasia. So, 
so she she uh, this is the resilience. So I you know I don't know if I've really hit on that, but the, the there's a, there's an incredible uh, resilience, and the, and that you know that really resounded in me just the the ability to um, overcome these obstacles every day, come in, sit there, do work, you know, be be a be a person. Um, so Tasia had got shot in the leg, and um, what happened was she was like back in school like three or four days later, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. So and that's what they do, you know. It's just the kids are tough. Uh, uh, Bruce Guthrie, do you do you see any long-term solution to this, or is it all going to be treading water as far as you can tell? Well, I, I, you know, I I, I think that. To the my 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 goal here is that we lean towards uh, it, there there's not there the, the best behavior management is rigorous instruction right but um, beyond that I think that there needs to be a space for compassion for you know the children and their environment so. You know, a lot of the ideas are in play. So, and and actually, since 2016, like you know, the whole idea, the whole idea of trauma is is everywhere now, and um, you know, people have a lot more compassion for the for the situations that people come from. So, I think that until you can integrate, um, you know, a more compassionate structure onto such a boiling pot of 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 issues. You're constantly going to be on the on the treadmill. So, uh, so you know, my m the, s the 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 solution is to provide very effective, you know, social social services, and also, you know, my wife Kathy, who I want to give a shout out to, who was with me through all this, um, is is like a qigong trainer and a coherent bre coherent breathwork person. And that was a huge part of any teachers, you know, I, I, you know, regarding the self-care, uh, getting through these situations. You know, you need to have some sort of a, a way of, um, you know, regulating your your system. The what? Oh yeah. So uh, a, the the a story. Um, one of, one of the things regarding teaching down there, which Miss Edgar knows about, is that uh, you're constantly observed, right? So, I, and 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 the, and the people would come in. You had no idea who they were. So that so they weren't even from the school. They would just come in and sit down and just start typing or whatever. So, so 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 I learned from some of the you know savvy heads is you need to have a plan for this, right? So, so you know, I told the kids, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're I, I, and and <laughs> so what? What there was a code with the teachers that if any stranger was in the building, that the British are coming, right? The idea was that the British. Are coming. So, so every everyone would be on 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 high alert, and um, so I told you know I, I had a self-contained class at that time of like. 12 kids that they shipped in from all over the city, but that's a whole another story. Um, but uh, so I said, hey, you know, we're probably going to get observed today, and uh, you know, if you guys do a good job, we'll we'll have a pizza party, right? And uh, so I and I used to do breaths with do deep breaths with them all the time. I was like, um, you know, okay, let's do our deep breaths. You want to do do five? And Zyquan's like, can we do 30? <laughs> is day one when you went in that classroom because we talked about the sort of relationship relationship building of course is, is the critical part of all of this how did you from that very first day try to develop that relationship with those kids well I, I you know it's a it's a very humbling thing right and and so you know to go, it, it's hell I mean it's so healthy to to be forced into humility right I mean it's, it's just a great thing and and um, as much as you fight it and so with all humility I, I, I watched what Miss Sullivan did you know I watched what Miss Yugi did I watched what Miss Worthington did I watched Miss Wooten Miss Toby I, w I watched everybody 
and 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 saw how they they dealt with this incredibly complex world you know and singing doesn't hurt Anything else that you want to know about this magnificent human being here who has written a very good book? Earlier on, you mentioned that the FBI felt it necessary to come to the school. Why? So this is, one th this, so this is the cultural dissonance thing that I'm learning about and referring to, is I I if you, if you, if, uh, why, just to direct, directly answer your question, is it was a program a mentoring program. So it was a mentoring program. Of course, many of the people felt that they're just like, you know, docking up their databases on, on poor black kids so they can track them and follow them, you know, and uh, understandably so. so. So that's the cultural dissonance part. But that was the program. It was a mentoring program. So does the FBI go to middle class white schools too? <laughs> So oddly enough, for the first time in my life, I am teaching at a mi middle class white school right now. So, so yeah, I, d I don't see any FBI people there. <laughs> I didn't think so. So, so the, the question is, what role does class play in this situation? Because I would assume that you're a middle class white yeah. male. Yeah. And so you go to a school in which the majority of the students look like me. Right. Do you think that's an issue? Well, I mean, there, you know, and I, and I totally understand the question. Again, this goes to the cultural dissonance thing, right? Yeah. Is, um, you know, and people would say it. So one of the great things that working about Amidon, uh, Amidon Bowen, is everything's on the table, right? And, and like when you're with people, they would say, you know, it was better when just all black people taught here, right? And, um, you know, personally, I think that, that we all have a lot to learn from each other and that I, I'm not, you know, like my, going, going into this situation, I had not only been with white people. So like I, I played basketball, you know, crazy for years and was, you know, on, on the team one time where I was the only white guy and a bunch of bl all black people. But um, so it wasn't an unfamiliar situation to me. But it, it, again, the, the the cultural dissonance part I think is something that that can't be ignored but I I do think that it's good for people to you know be involved with people of different races okay thank you and thank you. I think that th what we want to honor is that row of people who are t teaching there every day and have been teaching there every day and Bernard is not setting himself out as a person that was other than really because that row of people that are doing this every single day really take the greatest kudos uh there was a do you want to go to the mic and give us i think you're one of the teachers yes I, I'm, and i'm sure. still there <laughs> so along with the, a lot of the rest over there but um the fbi part of it was because of our location of our school oh, they could yeah. go there after work or during lunch and it was a, vi a very diverse group of people it wasn't like you know what you see in the FBI movies from like the 90s, um, and they did help a lot. It, it, yeah. it helped with that bridge of like, we don't want them around us. To they came and played basketball with the kids. They just checked in, asked them how they were doing. Some of them tutored. Um, we also have a great connection with the uh, police department, which is also right next to our school. They come in, the kids know them. They do. They have a band that performs and stuff like that. So I think a lot of times. We forget we're literally blocks away from the, nas the National Gallery of Art. Like the museums are right down the street, and the kids never go there. So we do get a lot of opportunities just based on location. Right. Well, that and 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 that's a great point, Ms. Shorn. Is also one of the things that was always shocking about it is the school is like you know eight blocks from the U.S. Capitol. So you know there's a dissonance there, right? Anyone else? Well, then, I guess we're going to conclude this time with Bernie. And the book is, of course, available, Music in the Halls. Are you going to write something next? Do you have another book in your mind? Uh, yeah, I've actually started on uh, something I actually want to mine 
some advice from my friends over here regarding my experience at Rika. So. And what is it about? Uh, well, it, that that book is is really about the idea of madness and mental health, and you know what 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 do we see as as normal? What do we see as aberrant? Um, and how things are categorized and how people are segmented from each other. Well, maybe we'll be sitting in these chairs next year <laughs> to hear about that book. Will you all come back? Thank you.